Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Uh, see, we're in this culture wars, but I think what we need to do is we need to define what culture really is. Amen. Uh, we need a definition for culture. We need to understand what culture is. And so I, I want us to, to dive into to what culture really the definition is of culture. The arts, beliefs, customs, institutions, and other products of human work. Did you notice that within the definition of human work? And thought considered as a unit, especially with regard to a particular time or social group. Think about this. It also continues, these arts, beliefs, and other products considered with respect to a particular subject or mode of expression. It continues on the definition of culture, the customary beliefs, the customary beliefs, social forms, Immaterial traits of racial, religious, or social group. The characteristic features of everyday existence. Did you notice that? The characteristic features of everyday existence, such as diversions or a way of life shared by people or people in a place or time. There's a lot of people in this, right? There, I see a lot of human um, uh, interaction within culture, right? I see a lot of choices from us within culture, do, do I not? I, I think this is something that, that we, we see quite a bit. And it even goes to, here, here's just a, a definition that I found that, that I believe really sums it up too, is culture is typically used to describe the patterns, traits, products, attitudes, and then intellectual or artistic activity associated with a particular population, with people, right? Because this is what we're in the midst of, culture wars, right? This is what, this is what we're talking about is culture, right? And, and, and I, I believe that we have to understand really what culture really is. And there's cultural differences throughout cities, throughout states, throughout nations, countries, right? There's all kinds of different cultures. But can I, can I be politically correct? Or, or maybe I, I should use this because I like this a little bit better. Can I be biblically correct that, you know what, uh, culture is really defined or created by human beings, man, men and women, right? By God's creation. Can, can we be honest? Because this is what the definition really says is, is by people, by, by the, the beliefs, by characteristic features of everyday existence, by human beings, by the the population, the traits, the products. So, so it really has something to do with us, right? Because we really need to define culture. But I also love what the scripture says, and I'm going to go right back to this, because it defines who God really is. Because see, in the culture wars, we need to define culture. And then the second thing we need to define is, who is this God? What's God capable of? Uh, you know, we need a definition for God, right? Right? I believe that in order to understand, we have to understand something about God because we're going somewhere today because it says in Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. Who have they forsaken? Jeremiah says, you have forsaken Jehovah, God Almighty, the fountain of living waters. So it's, he's an example of living waters. Have you ever been down a stream, how peaceful a stream is? How incredible a, a stream is? See, a, a stream, a fountain is a source, the source of something understood as a fountain. You, this is what it means. Fountain means a source, as in the place where water begins and continues to flow. God has a beginning, amen? Amen. Because he's self-existent, amen? He doesn't rely on existing on anything else because God does not need anything else to exist on, amen? He is the creator of all. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's Jehovah. Uh, nothing's created God. God is God, and he's existed on his own because he doesn't need anything to exist from. We can't understand it. It's not for us to understand his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. It's for us to have the faith that God is God and he's almighty. See, we have to understand who God is. He is a fountain of living waters. He's like a stream that has pure water. That's endless. He's continuous. He's always trustworthy. 
He's never changing. He's not going to lie. He is a healer to all. He is a provider to all. He's a deliverer to all. We have a mighty God. Amen. He's an I am in every situation to each and every one that wants to trust in him, that wants to put their confidence in him. We have a mighty God. See, it says in Jeremiah 17, 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall, shall be written in earth because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. He is a fountain of living waters. He is the one that gives life. He's the one that loves unconditionally. He's the one that cannot hate an individual because he is love. We have to know who our God is. He's our banner. He's our righteousness. He's our salvation. He's our peace in the midst of a storm. He's in the peace in the midst of the calm as well. See, we have to know who God is. We have to know that he's our Jehovah Jireh. Amen. We, ha we have to know something about God it says in John 14, 4, 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. All oh, this fountain of living water. If I choose to drink of this, if I choose to drink of God almighty, I'll never thirst. I'll never want. I I'll never covet. I I I you know, I I'm always going to be full. I'm always going to be satisfied because it's the fountain of living water. It's never going to be corrupt. It's never going to lead me the wrong way. It's never going to consume me to the point of, oh, you know what, uh, 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 of, of destroying me. It's always going to encourage. It's always going to edify. It's always going to convict. It's always going to see me or want me to go from glory to glory. It's always going to love me no matter where I'm at or what I'm in the midst of because God loves his children. Am I getting anywhere today? Am I explaining God in any way to you that, you know what, we understand that he is an almighty God? Because, see, we need to understand who God is. We need to understand he is the fountain of living water. We need to understand that whenever I come and I drink of him, I'll never thirst again. For he is my shepherd I shall not want. Because when he truly, when I truly drink of him, then I'm satisfied with whatever he gives me. I'm not coveting. I'm not prideful. I'm not greedy. I I'm not looking for what pleases me. I'm looking for what pleases him. I'm not looking for my will. I'm looking for his will. I'm not looking for my desires. I'm looking for his desires. I I'm not looking for what, what, what I can get out of it. I'm looking for what he can get out of it. I'm looking at individuals that I want to make sure everyone's saved and set apart just as God is because I'm drinking of the living water. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. So whenever I really partake of the fountain of water, I become a fountain of living water for others. Isn't that what faith? Faith is the size of a mustard seed. But when that mustard seed, when you really read it, that that mustard seed should grow into a refuge, into a shade for others, right? Right? When I drink of the living water of my God, that no matter what storm I'm facing, no matter what Goliath I'm facing, no matter what mountain I'm facing, I, I, I can have a peace that surpasses all understanding. I, I can know that he's my provider. I, I can know that who God really is because God's a big God, is he not? See, it says in Psalms 36, 9, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. So in the midst of these culture wars, we need to, define one what really is culture and then we needed to define really who's God right because this is where we're going and this is where I'm gonna spend most of my time this morning is three when culture comes against God's word and see this is where we need to spend some time because when culture comes against God's word it, it, it's a mess isn't it because, see, see, I, I want to express to you and I want to talk to you how God feels about culture. God's OK with culture. As long as it doesn't contradict his word. God's OK with us having a culture, doing certain things that we do. As long as it doesn't come against his word. But see, when there's the conflict of culture against God's word, that, that's where the issue becomes. And I believe that we're living in this day where culture is coming against the word of God. 
where abortion's okay, but it's really not according to God's word. Homosexuality is okay, and we're okay with the the rainbow all being distorted, uh, but it's not okay, right? See, there's a conflict between culture and God's word right now to this day. There's a problem where where racism is is supposedly, you know, and and still exists. There's a problem. Culture and and God's word is not going to mix if culture becomes the idol above God. See, not all things are bad about culture, but it cannot have authority over the word of God in our lives. When culture defines the church, that's when we dismiss God. And too many times, cultures, it's whittled in. It's made a way in. And it's changing the church. Oh, pastor, I understand what you're saying. Well, before you understand what I'm saying is I want you to understand you need to stand in the mirror and point your finger at yourself because we are the church. I'm not pointing at a building. I'm pointing at each and every individual because each and every individual is the church. And as soon as we allow culture to start defining us, we will dismiss the word of God within our lives. But the problem is, is culture is transforming us instead of the word of God. We're being transformed by culture instead of the word of God. Because uh, we can easily sit here and look through the eyes of culture at this message, or we can easily back up and look at it through the eyes of God. Because I don't care what culture says, God's word will stand the test of time. God's word is what created everything. God's word is what's going to exist. God's word is what's going to save you. God's word is what's going to bless you. Culture is not. See, Romans 12, 2 says, and do not be conformed to this world. Huh? What does it say? Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to culture. Do not be conformed to your beliefs, to your desires, to your, your, oh, you know what, your emotions and your feelings. Amen? Because this is what culture's doing. Culture's just saying it's okay. And God's word is saying it's not okay. And we have to get back to God's word where it says it's not okay. And standing for God. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, as soon as culture transforms us, we're going to lose our identity in God. And once we lose our identity in God, then that means we're serving culture instead of God. Because we should be getting our identity from God Almighty because we're made in His image. So really, if if I'm getting my identity from culture, from others, from other beliefs, then God's Word, then I'm just believing a lie. Because I can't change the fact that I'm created in His image. All I can do is distort his image. See, this is where whenever we allow culture to change God's word, when we adapt to culture, then we get a watered down gospel. We get a watered down gospel. We get that it's okay. You know what? It's okay for a little lie. You know what? It's not really a big lie. See, we're going somewhere today because see, a culture it, you know, it develops a about me attitude, an I attitude, a me attitude. It, it, it's, you know, it develops pride. What can I get out of the situation instead of what I can give? Culture produces pride, arrogance, and covetousness. Amen? Is, isn't this what we see all throughout culture right now? You can, can do whatever you want to do. You can get whatever you can. You know, it's all about you. I want it now. And I don't give a crap what it takes. It's about me. See, whenever culture comes up against God's word, it's not going to be pretty, is it? But see, the churches, we as the church of God, we've allowed culture to come in and we've watered down the gospel. We've justified sin by culture. And all culture has done is created a gray area that God isn't pleased with. Because culture will take the word that's black or white, right or wrong, and it kind of intermixes it, and it puts it in the gray area to justify our sins. Can we just be honest? Because this is what culture's doing. It's okay to kill babies. It's okay to, I can pick whatever sex that I want to be. It's not okay because God did not make a mistake. 
Cultures develop that we can live by sight and not by faith. Cultures develop, you can see it throughout the Bible. How about the Pharisees? Well, show me a sign. Well, you can't even believe Moses. You can't even believe the word of God, Jesus said. So if you can't even believe Moses, you're not even going to believe a sign because I've already performed all these miracles and you've yet to believe that I'm the Messiah. You've yet to believe that I'm the Son of God. But see, this is what culture does. Culture wants to live by sight and not by faith. So it's about what I can get. It's about what I can do. It's about me right now. It's about what exists. Not realizing that this is all temporal, amen? That, oh, what we're looking at isn't even going to make it to heaven, amen? Your bank account's not going to make it to heaven. Your nice car's not going to make it to heaven. Your slothfulness isn't going to, oh, it's going to be consumed through the fire, amen? Oh, can we talk real? See, culture says I need to be focused on the flesh instead of the spirit. See, I, I need to be focused on the healing because I need to be healed right now. I need to be provided right now instead of focusing on the spirit that, you know what? I have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Whether I go through the storm, whether I'm healed or not, I still have a God that's still God. I still have a God that's a fountain of living water that's supplying me strength in the midst of the storm. That's oh, He's already made a way of escape. See, but culture doesn't look at it that way, does it? Culture wants the flesh instead of the spirit. Do you, see, do you see, see the distortion? Do you see the confusion that's been going on for years? Do you see this within the culture, how it's changing and, and it's making gray areas within the word of God? And what does God say about the gray, air, gray areas? Oh, he's going to vomit them out of his mouth. He, they're going to be worse than anything else. Because now what you're doing is you're putting out in the midst of believers and unbelievers that I can mix sin with truth and sin and truth cannot be mixed together. But this is what culture tries to do. See, culture would develop a loss of power within his children. We start believing in other things. I start believing what Google says. I start believing what Facebook says. I start believing everything else, but, but I, I never go back to the Word of God to see what the Word of God says. I see all hell breaking loose. I see famines coming. I see a storm coming. But my God says the righteous will not be forsaken. Uh, my God says that, you know, I, I will not be lacking or begging. Uh, my God says he will provide for me. See, I, I don't live by the flesh because I know that's what the culture wants you to do. Because the culture wants you to live by the, the next individual that's really skinny, that has a six-pack instead of a one-pack. You know what? The culture wants to say you're not smart enough because of your IQ. The, oh, isn't that what the culture's doing? Can we talk real today? Because we are the church. And we're allowing culture to influence us instead of the influence of God's word. And as soon as we allow culture to influence us, that's becoming an idol over God's word. That's why we need to stand for God's word. That's why we need to believe in God's word. And see, when we allow culture to come in, then we start minimizing the power of God, right? We start relying on other things. We start believing and trusting in other things. And just because we rely on or trust other things doesn't make God any less powerful than what he is. He's still God. Just because we choose to believe something else, just because we allow culture to come in, doesn't change God. Doesn't change that he's all-powerful. Doesn't change that he's all-forgiving. Doesn't change that he's still Lord and Savior. It doesn't change that he's the peace that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't change that he's still the healer. It doesn't change that he's still not the deliverer. He's still God. He's still almighty. He's still omnipotent. He's still omniscient. He's still omnipresent. He's still God. He's still I am. He's still Jehovah. He's still Yeshua HaMashiach. He's still everything that the word of God says because he is the word of God. It doesn't change anything but we are allowing culture to change God. But I'm here to tell you, I don't care what you think. I don't care what culture is driving you to. You're not going to change God. 
culture's changing you and not changing God, and that's the problem this day and time. Just as I had a Catholic priest email me about homosexuality. You need a love, you need a love, you need a love, and you need a love. Apparently, you didn't go back to the message, and apparently, you can't separate your feelings and your emotions from the Word of God because you're allowing culture to dictate your emotions and your feelings and your stance on the Word of God because the Word of God says this, and there's nothing that's going to change it. This is what God says. Let's get our emotions and feelings out of it and let's make sure that we are godly and make sure that we do have love and make sure we stand on God, but we have to be firm with God's word. We cannot allow culture to water down the gospel. We cannot allow culture to minimize the word of God. We cannot allow culture to justify our sins or our stance with someone else. I still love the individual, but lying is still wrong. Thievery is still wrong. Because as soon as what we, what, this is what's going to happen. Oh, you can say, oh, it never happened. But there's a lot of things that we can step back and look and say, well, it should have never happened. But if culture keeps going and feelings, emotions involved in it, then we're going to okay thievery. Well, you know what? But he stole for this. Oh, we just need to, if you're going to steal for this, then, then we need to allow it. A thief's a thief. It's wrong. A lie's a lie. It's wrong. But see, we're allowing culture to come in and dictate the word of God instead of the word of God dictating and defining the church. Look at how culture changed the church. Have you ever looked at it? Let me just tell you, we build churches according to culture, right? What's a culture like? Oh, let's, let's have an entertainment. Let's have a show. Let's bring in the LED lights. Let's bring in the fog machine so they can have an experience. Well, how about if we remove the experience and have the encounter of God? Because that's going to do much more than the haze machine is going to do. Because I'm going to walk out coughing and wanting to sue the church because, oh, I got too close to the fog machine. Oh, and I inhaled something I shouldn't have. But once you inhale Jesus Christ, once you inhale the Holy Spirit, it will change your life. And that's what we need because culture is changing the churches. How we build the churches, how we run the churches, how we teach, how we pray, how we believe, and how we live. Culture's changing. We're the church. Jeremiah 2.11 says, Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory for what does not profit? See, allowing culture to come in is justifying. See, we're looking through the eyes of culture instead of the eyes of God. Culture has changed the church to be against people and not sin. Think about it. Culture's changed. People. That now we're against people because of the sin instead of being against the sin. But God, God, God came to save the sinners because he loved the sinners, because he loved the life, because he loved the individual. He doesn't like the sin, but he loves the individual. But too many times, oh, we've changed, cultures changed the mindset that I have to hate the individual because of the sin, but Jesus would have never came if that was the case. But this is what culture does, and this is the reason why we justify all the actions that are completely sin because we don't want to hurt the individual. I can still love the individual and tell you that you're not doing right and you need to change your life because I love you and I don't want you to go to hell. But this is what the Word of God says. If you do this, 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 you're going to hell. See, if I truly love someone, I'll, I'll, I'll remove the culture aspect, my beliefs, my feelings, my emotions, the things that, that are against God's word, and I'll go back to God's word, and I'll understand that I really love the individual, and I choose for you not to jump off the cliff because God has a purpose and a plan for you. But you see how culture's changed, the church? To be against people instead of against the sin. Culture says it's okay for a little lie, right? but it's still a lie. James 1, 2 through 4. My brother, and count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. See, culture tells you it, it, it's, about, it's about me now. Culture doesn't teach you about patience, does it? 
When I order this package, it better show up in my front door before I get to my front door. When I want a meal, I expect that meal. Yeah, you, you mean you have to wait for this? You mean I have to go through this? You mean I have to go through this pro- process to be healed? You mean I actually have to apply for the job and wait for the promotion? See, culture teaches us that, you know, uh, uh, there, there, there shouldn't be no patience. Uh, I shouldn't have to wait upon the Lord. I, I should get whatever I want, and I should be able to get it now. Oh, you know what? I should be able to live however I want Monday through Saturday, and I'll repent on a Sunday, and I should be okay. That's what culture tells you. You don't have to worry about your lifestyle. You don't have to worry about how you live. You don't have to worry about anything at all. It's about you, and it's only about you, and don't give a crap about anyone else. You can walk over them. You can stab them. You don't have to have no respect or consideration for them because culture teaches that there's absolutely no respect or consideration i was pulling out Publix yesterday and i was in my right i'm going down the right lane and you know what they have designated lanes one goes this way and one goes the other way and i was stopped at the stop sign and some lady was waving me on because she wanted to go the wrong way to get her spot because it's all about her a hypocrite and a viper and i sat there and i went this way and she's like, and I'm like, and I wasn't going to move. I'll let the tires run off the car before I move that thing. I would, oh, I'm just telling you, hey, your pastor has problems too. I, he needs Jesus. I'm just telling you, don't put your trust in pastors, amen? Put your trust in God. Because if you saw me yesterday at Publix, you would say, well, that guy ain't no pastor. I'm, and I ain't moving. She went all the way around, cut across the line, and got right into the parking spot. Then she took a while to get out. Not that I was waiting, but she finally did. And the window came down. I don't know how. I must have accidentally hit the button. But I want to make sure she knew how disrespectful and inconsiderate she was. And she thought my name was Karen. So I called her Karen because that must have been her name. I hit certain points, but this is culture. We live in a society, there's no patience. There's no forgiveness. There's no, you know, even though they're doing wrong, that doesn't mean I'm the police, right? But I can stand for God's word. Uh, We live in a culture that it, it doesn't, the rules doesn't apply. Respect doesn't apply. Consideration doesn't apply. Uh, don't we live in a culture that how many times you hear from young kids, you know what, you Mr. and Miss, yes, sir, and no, sir, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Uh, we've changed the culture that, you know what, it's just about me. Where's my V-Bucks? Where's my game? Where's my food? It's all about me, and I want it now. And then we're wondering what's going on with the generations and the culture. And there's disrespect in 80-year-old, 90-year-olds, just as well as there is 8- or 9-year-olds. Amen? This is culture, and we need to change this, but this is culture redefining who we really are. And we are defined by God's Word, not by culture. But too many times in this world, we're allowing culture to redefine us, and we are not in God's image. Culture is destroying people. Did you understand that? Culture is destroying people. Because, see, God's word is truth. God's word is obedience brings the blessing. But if I choose to change, culture is really defeating me. Culture is destroying people. Let me just tell you, self-inflicted wounds is what culture is doing. Because it's all about me. It's pride. It's all about what I can get. See, culture is really fighting against us, not for us. It's creating a monster. Because we're allowing culture to overcome God's word. We're allowing culture to define us instead of God's word. We're allowing culture to determine our decisions, our reactions. See, culture can produce idols. For example, pastors. How many times has pastors been an idol? They're just a man, a woman, a human being that needs the same Savior as everyone else. But how many times has cultures developed this this idol? When was the last time? I'm all for honor and respect because I serve pastors. I have no problem serving pastors. I'll clean their toilet. I'll bring them coffee. I'll bring them water. Because there's honor and respect within the Bible. I'm not saying that. But there's never an idol above God. But how many times we've made an idol? We've made, and I'm just using pastors as an example because I am one. But I'll serve anyone and everyone because I believe that that's what our DNA really is because God came to serve and not to be served. How many times have we made idols out of pastors? 
because that's the culture. Oh, he's everything. Oh, he's he's still a man. I'm going to give him honor. I'm going to give him respect. I'll give him reverence. But God is my God, not this pastor. But when was the last time you saw a pastor getting the glory and he knew that he was an idol? He knew he was elevated in these people's lives over God, which he should never be elevated above God in any of the sheep's life because the pastor should be pointing to God and never taking the credit for God. And when was the last time you saw a pastor rip its clothes and say, not me, as the apostles did several times, as the disciples did, when people came down and bowed down to Paul or to Peter, they ripped their clothes. Don't you bow down to me. I'm just a man. Let me just tell you who I am. But see, cultures changed that, right? Yeah. 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 You know who I am. I have a one-way connection with God. Yeah, I have a lot of money in the bank. I'm a business owner. Can we just be honest? Culture is destroying people. Culture can produce idols, pastors, athletes. How many athletes has been an idol? Sex, power. There's all kinds of things out there. Culture's developing an attitude that socialism's okay. Do you know that there's, there's well over 50% of the young kids in high school and college right now that believes that socialism's completely fine? They'll believe that you know, until after they, you know, God forbid if something ever happens and we, we became that, and then their phone's taken away, then they're not going to like it. Or their privileges. They need to go live in Venezuela or Cuba in a place that, you know, really, you know, let me, they need to listen. See, it, it's part of like, you know what, the culture's dictating what's the truth, right? When we really need to go back to the Bible and we need to seek out the truth because God's word is the absolute truth. And when we seek out the truth, we're going to realize is there's individuals that came over to be a citizen legally in America. And they're talking about the reason why they wanted to is because they were in the midst of socialism. But see, the culture, it's all about the culture. Culture and my beliefs and, and what I'm going to do and my emotions and my feelings. Culture produces instant nows and thrills. Going from one thrill to another thrill meaningless lives about themselves, lack of respect for others, no consideration for others, no value within their own lives, pleasure-seeking society, pleasure over purpose, consumer over produce, because we should be producing, right? But we become, what? Consumers. And we also have a culture of slothfulness, laziness that we're producing. It's okay to sit at home and get a check because the government's gonna pay. It's okay not to amount to anything. It's okay not to do anything because you owe me. The working guy owes me. It's okay not to learn. It's okay not to to do anything. Can we be honest? Culture creates the gray areas which God despises. And these are all gray areas. These are all things that we need to understand. We've all done it. We're all doing it. I'm not pointing out anybody because I'm just as guilty as they all. But we need to be aware of it that culture does not define us. We do not make decisions off of culture. We make decisions and we're defined and we live according to the word of God because he is my supplier. He is my fountain of living waters. In the midst of a famine, he is still feeding me and providing me because it says in the midst of the desert, he's still going to have streams of living water coming in because he's going to take care of his kids. Culture justifies Just think, it's going to be a sad day when we're standing in front of Jesus and we're trying to justify getting into heaven. Because that's all culture does. The church cannot, must not, nor should not change to culture because culture does not define the church. It is the word of God that defines the church. It's the word of God that defines you and I. Which brings me back to the scripture. Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. We've talked about that. God is everything. He is that living water. But then what else does the scripture say? And then what did we do? We've hewn themselves out, cisterns. Broken cisterns that can hold no water. We've forsaken him. In our cultures, that cistern. Do you know what a cistern is? You know, it was always, Jeremiah used this context because this is what they were living by. 
It is if you wanted fresh living water, if you wanted to make sure that water that was clean, that you didn't have to worry about catching a disease, that you knew that was going to be healthy, that was going to be always running and always fresh, you went down to the, the running water. You went down to the stream. So he used us that, you know what? You, know, you guys are out serving other gods. You guys are out serving culture. Culture's trying to redefine you. And culture's like a cistern that you're, you're making out of this rock. It's nothing living within this. It's stagnant water. And too many times we as Christians, we become stagnant. And it's saying that, you know what? You have hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Because, see, the cisterns was because they, maybe they wasn't able to make it to living water. Maybe they were slothful. Maybe they were lazy. Maybe, I don't know what the case was but they chose to hewn themselves out in rock these water pools and these water pools would collect rainwater which was brackish it was had algae it was stagnant there wasn't anything moving in it stuff would grow in it have you ever seen a pond that doesn't have water that's coming in and flushing it out things are becoming stagnant eventually nothing can live in it because it's overcome with everything else that is deadly oh it's overcome oxygen's not flowing in it life's not flowing in it and this this is what Jeremiah was saying. You guys have chosen culture over God's word. You guys are allowing culture to change you. And you know what? You're expecting culture to provide for you. You're expecting culture to, to, to heal you. You're expecting culture to make a way. And I'm here to tell you, you've built something that is leaking and it will not even hold water. It won't even hold death. It won't give you life. And I'm here to tell you that God is the only fountain of living water and if you drink of him you'll never thirst this is what culture's doing cultures like cisterns they give us hope sometimes and then we're moving on to the next one because it's really a deadly pool of water it's become stagnant nothing lives in it it's algae the frogs won't even live in it after a while you can't drink of it and you know, not only that, it has a leak and it dries up. It kind of sounds like the world. Sin will never be full. It will never be happy. You'll always want more. You always want more. You always want more adultery. You always want more sex. You always want more pornography. You want more lies. You want more money. You want more, oh, provision. You want more this. You want more, because see, you know, uh, hell is never full. Sin is, sin is uh, it's an empty thing. You know, it's, it's just, it satisfies only right now, but this is what culture's teaching. That, you know, oh, you can be satisfied right now, but then you're gonna have to look for the next thing. You're gonna have to look for the next happy meal. You're gonna have to look for the next this. You have, to, you know what, oh, you know what, if you want a healthy meal, it might take you some time to prepare it, but you know what, if you want a fast food thing you can go eat grease and be right away but you know what it's going to show that's how we are spiritually it's, we hewn some cisterns out and we're partaking of the water that's stagnant that's dead there's no life and you know what every once in a while we come back and it's empty and then I have to look for culture to lead me down another wrong avenue when God says I'm a fountain of living water if you come to me, you'll never thirst. See, this is a great scripture, and I was telling my wife, and my wife gave me this scripture, and I just thought it was really good because this is what we do. It kind of reminds me of Saul. Because how many times Saul, he had wait on the Lord, right? He made some bad decisions, didn't he? He didn't wait for Samuel, the prophet. He would just, you know, oh, I don't have patience. I got to do this right now. Oh, you know what? I got I to gotta go find something. So let me go find a, a fortune teller. Oh, let me go find this witchcraft. Let me go find a witch and, and just give me some guidance and direction. You know what? Instead of going back, see, he was drinking out of a cistern that caused his death. Instead of going to the living water. But this is how culture is. It's loud. It's noisy. It's in our face. And he goes right to 1 Kings 19. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, 
What are you doing here, Elijah? See, culture's in our face. Culture's the fire. It, it, it's, it's blazing, right? We see it. We see everything. We see Pride Month, right? We see abortion. We see lies. We see corruption. See, the cistern's full that, that, you know, we're believing all the lies of everything else, the, the media, the social media, the televisions, and everything else because we're not living off the living water because if I was living off the living water, I'd understand what God really meant. I'd understand what the prophets meant. That's why I can't wait until Trump's back in the White House because God's word's going to come to pass. Let me just tell you. Oh, Pastor, you can't speak that. Yeah, I can. I can. Because of the lies in the enemy or anything that's been stolen or anything that's corrupt cannot stand. It's like a cistern that will leak. Eventually it will be gone. And the only thing there will be God. The living water. The truth. The absolute truth. See, we need the absolute truth. But he's not in the wind. He's not in the storms. He's not in the loud voice. He's not in the magazines. He's not in the social media. He's in his word. You hear that small, still voice. Wait upon me. I'm the fountain of living waters. I have provision for you. I am the way maker. I will destroy the Goliath. Don't live by sight. Live by faith. See, God never created us to be the stagnant water. Because he said, out of our hearts. This is what it says in John 7, 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Let's drink of the living water today. I'm done. I'm not even going to finish the message. I think we're done here. This sets up the culture wars. We're allowing culture to come in and redefine us. It's time that we step back and we realize that God is God. Culture doesn't define God. I don't define God. I'm defined by God. He is the living water. He is the fountain of living waters. And if I come to him, I'll not thirst again. That doesn't mean I'm not going to go through issues. But through those issues, you know what? I'm going to have a peace whether he heals me or not. I'm going to have a peace whether my Lamborghini is provided or not. I don't want no Lamborghini, but I'm just using it as an example. I'm going to have peace whether it's provision or not because I know God is my provider. I know he's my way maker. Can we do that today? Let's step out of culture. Let's stop, step out of everything that's going on. The flesh. Let's start looking at the spiritual side. But I have a mighty God. I'm saved and set apart. Culture does not define me. God's word defines me. I have to choose what's right, not by emotions or feelings, but by what the word of God says. Because if you really want to be a helper to someone, it will be more like Jesus. And Jesus didn't come to get defined by culture. He came to change culture. Your views are wrong. Your idols are wrong. Your sin's wrong. I love you. I'm the Savior. Believe in me. Repent. Go and sin no more. Culture didn't define him. Culture strapped him and put him on a cross. Which I'm glad because we needed a savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I hope that you enjoyed the message today and I hope that you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you have not and you would like to right now, all you have to do is ask for forgiveness of your sins and receive Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior and you are saved and set apart. That's all it is. And I want you to email me. I want you to email me so I can be praying with you, that I can be believing with you, that we can equip you, that we can stay in contact with you because I want to welcome you to the family. And while you're here watching right now, make sure you check us out at Peak Worship and make sure you get involved with all of our social medias. That means you like us, you follow us, check everything out about us so you can get plugged in. Amen. And we will see you next time.